while we're waiting, if uh, if you are tuning in from somewhere other than Victoria, throw it throw it in the chat. And if, if you're from Victoria, give us a shout out as well. Elena, Miriam, Matthew, and I are, are tuning in from Victoria. So we want to see who we're reaching here. Victoria, nice. Hey, Justine from Toronto. Galway, like Ireland? Ireland? Whoa, nice. <laughs> I really wanted to go to Galway when I was there. That's really cool. Uh, Whistler, nice. Victoria, Toronto. It's so interesting to see where everyone's tuning in from. We had someone from the UK at one of our last events, Calgary. Uh, Sanda raised her hand. It may, may have been an accident, but Sanda, throw in the chat where you're tuning in from. Lexi from Kelowna. Nice, this is awesome. From Barrie, Ontario. Very nice. Right mm -hmm. by Canada's Wonderland. Lucky That's you. That's right. <laughs> nice. All right. I. It's just after one. I can get started because I know you're all here to listen to Matthew and not me. So if people are going to trickle in over the next couple minutes, they're only going to miss my introduction, which is nothing special anyways. But welcome to our second imposter syndrome event presented by Lighthouse Labs Career Accelerator in partnership with Dispatch. I'm going to give Matthew and Miriam as much time as possible today. So I just wanted to give a brief introduction to what the Career Accelerator initiative is all about and to uh, our awesome partners dispatch. So the intention of the Career Accelerator is to support individuals who are interested in exploring a career in technology through workshops, resources and events from on the ground in the industry. To do so we're working with industry partners and leveraging over six years of experience working with individuals launching new careers in technology. We're super excited to be presenting this series in partnership with Dispatch, an email production platform that allows teams to streamline their entire email creation process through a robust drag and drop email builder, collaboration features, and approval workflows. Dispatch believes that growing the communities around us is equally important to growing our business and that by doing so, they only get stronger. With that being said, we couldn't be more excited to be partnering with them on this initiative. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping things. Uh, number one, keep yourself muted throughout the duration of the event, just so that we can keep everything running smoothly. We will have time for a Q&A at the end of the session. So if you wanna turn your mic and your camera on then, please feel free to do so. That would be awesome. Just full disclosure, we are uh, recording the event. So if you do turn your camera on, uh, you will be recorded. Um, so if you have any questions that come up throughout or at the end, you can throw them in the chat and Elena and I will be monitoring just to make sure that everything uh, gets answered. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Miriam to kick things off uh, and super excited to see what Matthew has to share with us today. Hello, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, it's amazing to see so many people from everywhere. And as uh, Caroline said, we are located in Victoria. So I just wanted to start off with an acknowledgement. Um, we respectfully acknowledge the, the Lekwungen and Wasainic people whose unceded territories we live and work on. And we'd also like to express our gratitude to all of the Coast Salish people as we continue to work and live as guests on their land. Um, with that, I'd love to give uh, an introduction for our wonderful guest today. Um, Matthew Lehner is a CTO and co-founder of OneFeather, a platform which provides a singular access point for Indigenous people in Canada to access their rights and entitlements. For the past 10 years, he's worked as a full-stack developer, building and scaling digital products and people-first teams. 
most of the time, he's thinking about ways to improve the UX of products, code bases, and processes. So everyone give a very quiet virtual round of applause for Matthew. Um, and I just wanted to start off by asking you, Matthew, what did your path into tech look like? Um, I had a very sort of non-traditional path here. Uh, about 10 years ago, I was working in the green building industry and we hired some developers to do some custom stuff in-house for us. And they told me to sign up for GitHub. And I was like, oh, this is cool. And a year later, I had quit that job that I had and was I freelanced, um, just dove straight into freelancing because there was no, um, at the time, it was really hard to find like a web dev job in Victoria, or at least it seemed to be that way for me. So I just had randomly found contracts and stuff. And I did that for about seven years. Um, part of that, I met Lawrence, who's my, who's the founder at One Feather, um, where I work now. Uh, and I'm a co-founder and we started that project. Um, I took a little break for about two years where I was working at Pixel Union as the director of engineering and product and sort of helped that uh, the company transition from a, but I think it was about 60 people when I joined and we were at just over a hundred when I, uh, when I left. So went through a pretty big growth, growth phase and then, uh, one feather had <clears throat> gotten to a point where we'd gotten funding and we're ready to sort of like focus on the next round of things that we want to do. Um, and so I'm back there and uh, starting to build a team and just really focus in on um, some individual focused products that uh, traditionally we've been focused more on the First Nation administration side of things. So, yeah. Amazing to hear, and a lot of really diverse experience going from juggling your team uh, or doubling your company to co-founding a business. Um, since the topic is imposter syndrome, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, so for me, I feel like imposter syndrome is sort of like never feeling like I belong somewhere, even like um, for, like a really great example of this is, is uh, Alana and I were talking about this. Uh, it was going to be, I think it was going to be a like panel at the time before, you know, there was a global pandemic. Um, and so we were talking about it and um, I was like, oh, I have some experience with that. And, you know, uh, I deal, yeah. And then when she asked me to do this now, I was like, well, maybe I don't actually have enough imposter syndrome to like, actually provide, a, provide a, a point of view on it or something. And I feel like that's sort of the like crux of it is just always feeling like my experience isn't enough to be in the place that I am. Um, that goes from technical knowledge, being self-taught. Like I have, a, I have a finance degree, so like, <laughs> you know, it's, I'm definitely not educated in, well, you know, over the years I've, um, I've, learned a lot technically but um <laughs> i'm not educated that way um and so I, it's been a funny thing to sort of even now like i will hire people who have more experience being soft like working as a software developer in a company and i'm learning a lot from them just about how teams are put together and like traditional processes and stuff so it's this funny thing where um I don't know, to me, the, the, the thing about imposter syndrome is just always feeling like whatever it is that you're bringing to the table in a situation, or at least for me, whatever I'm bringing to the table in a situation isn't as valuable as the person next to me. That's really insightful. I can imagine that must be a lot, like quite relatable for people, especially in this group who also haven't come up in tech uh the traditional cs degree path that a lot of people talk about but is becoming more rare by the day um and i can imagine there must have been quite a lot of experiences that you must have had coming up that track um are there any experiences with imposter syndrome that you've had in your career that you can speak to um <clears throat> yeah i mean specifically i feel like there's this funny thing for me where um, 
I will, to go back to this event, for example, I will like put my name forward for something. And then when somebody's like, oh, we'd like to talk to you, I'm like, oh, they've made a mistake. Like that can't be for real. <laughs> um, <laughs> and um, I feel like that's happened for me almost every time that I get, uh, like I get a new contract or, or when I was freelancing or when, um, like when I, I, so the job at Pixel Union, when that happened, I had been there sort of on contract doing some help and like, it was clear they needed somebody in that top role. And I put my, you know, offered myself forward again. Um, and they chose me and, you know, the, the, that, that idea that, um, I'm always second guessing whether or not that was the right decision. Um, it's, it, you know, it just becomes this thing where, um, where the, the thing that I'm doing, like, if I let that self doubt or self talk kind of like sneak into the conversation, it's like, it can be super paralyzing. Cause I'm like, I'm not, I'm not able to, um, I'm not able to like move forward because I'm too worried about the idea that uh, somebody's going to like find me out, like, you know, literally being an imposter there. And I think really that there's been, um, for me, I guess the way that I've approached dealing with that is that um, most of, you know, this is something I've dealt with with most of my life. And I feel like almost everyone else here is uh, sort of in the same boat. I can see little messages popping up that kind of say the same thing. And um, I've always, there was, I had really, when I was really young, I was in a class in university where we, because I did a business degree, we had business leaders come in and they just talked about their experiences. And one of them, um, he talked about how he always said yes to anything and he tried to like move forward. Even if he didn't feel qualified, if he, if he didn't feel, um, even if he f didn't feel like it was a, like, you know, he was ready for it. It was this idea that you get to more interesting places by saying yes and sort of like just trying to, trying something, you know. And I feel like I've sort of, I really, it's almost, that's almost 20 years ago now for me, but it's, it's like really stuck by me where he, um, he had a few examples of how he'd said yes to specific careers or specific jobs or specific opportunities. Um, and it just, you know, he, I think at the time I didn't know what imposter syndrome was, but um, I feel like he was sort of saying that this, that you're always gonna have this internal doubt. So the idea of just like saying, you know, like internally, saying like okay well there's no harm in putting my putting myself out there a little bit uh yeah that's so great and it seems to have worked so despite i guess whatever anxieties have come along with it it seems like just putting your name forward is i mean it's a good recipe for success and at least at the very least you get great experience um i love that it's taking you to this great position that I think a lot of people would look up to and say like, oh, well, he, he must not have imposter syndrome as a CTO, as a co-founder of, of a tech business. Um, so I wanted to see from your perspective as a leader in tech, how do you think businesses and other leaders can build a culture that combats imposter syndrome? Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think when I, so I had a lot of experience working within teams and seeing the dynamics of different types of teams when I was freelancing. I had a few clients that I was with for a couple of years each and like um, would be embedded in, I was probably embedded in about five or six teams over that point in time, along with just like random contracts. But having that like sort of like really fast cross section of a lot of different cultures, um, it really gave me a sense of what I guess for me, what worked and what didn't, and I'm like, I'm a pretty sensitive human being. Um, and so like, I want to be in a spot where I feel safe. And it was interesting when I was at, so that the idea of like feeling safe um, 
really sort of resonates for me in how I want to create culture, a culture or like an industry even. Um, and when I was at Pixel Union, I started really digging into leadership styles and effective team um, development and stuff. And uh, Google did a research project a while back that talked about like the, the common dynamics of effective teams. And the top thing was psychological safety. So this idea that like, no matter what, when you bring something to the table, like there's, there shouldn't be any like, it, it, your idea might not be accepted uh, and it might not even be right, but at least you can bring it there and like have it be treated with respect. And I feel like that to me is probably the number one thing in dealing with imposter syndrome, uh, like from an organizational level. It's like, I think there's this sort of transition that's happened and it's part of why I love the tech industry. Like I've, I've worked in a bunch of different things um, up until I found sort of software development and landed here. But the thing that I like the most about the tech industry is that um, this isn't, I, I guess this isn't ubiquitous or true for all organizations, but like there's such a, it's such a new place that organizations haven't been afraid to try different ways of approaching leadership or management or organizational structures. And as a result, we've sort of seen a shift from the like top down management to knows best sort of approach to uh, running organizations to more of a um, like intrinsically motivated team members that are like given purpose or like, you know, you join a company or a team or a, a product, uh, yeah, company or team or whatever, because probably because it's in tech and they're like, you know, it's a, growing industry and their jobs but then like you can also get aligned with the company's values and get aligned with sort of the mission or whatever they're doing um, from that perspective and so i feel like that's given that's given um us as individuals who work in tech or um, want to work in tech the opportunity to be a little bit more choosy about what we do like we have this luxury of um not just having to get a job whereas like my parents just had to get a job whereas i'm like you know i'm like on the cusp of gen x millennial but i'm definitely like i want to follow my dreams and if you're not treating me with respect then i can just leave kind of kind of attitude and i feel like that's that um that gives us like on an individual level uh sort of a little bit more um bargaining or leverage over the traditional like dynamics that are between employer and, and employee. Um, and I think that, and this is a real meandering way to get to this point, but um, the idea being that once we are, once we've gotten to the like, uh, or this like, <laughs> sorry, I'll just pause for a second to cap, gather my thoughts. <clears throat> so yeah, once <laughs> once we've gotten the like like that idea that there's a little bit more leverage and it's not just like subsistence based employment that like we can um, sort of push the our employees or organizations to do the right thing and make spaces that are comfortable for us and do encourage growth and like development of people on those levels like more in the emotional intelligence space rather than just needing to be able to do a job. That's actually a really great take. I think that that's something that a lot of people, especially if they're struggling with imposter syndrome, don't consider is like, you can demand respect and you can demand to be heard and not chastised um, for mistakes or like saying the wrong thing um, or not knowing things. Um, I still, as a manager, sometimes have experiences where I feel like a team member might almost like come forward with like a failure which like we have a very like embracing failure culture and still i feel like people almost like flinch for like the bad response um and i really see it as our responsibility um as as people that can shape culture at in tech companies to kind of make sure that people don't feel that way otherwise 
what's the point? People, like you said, people do have options and um, that's a great thing to, to kind of lean on. So mm -hmm. I like that take a lot. Um, um, I, th uh, I just lost it, but I had something to add on there, which is, um, oh man, it, it'll come back to me in a second. If it does, feel free to chime in. Um, yeah. I did want to jump back to uh, kind of your role and uh, people's expectations of you. Um, so I know that there's often a sense that individuals who've had great success in their field wouldn't have feelings of self-doubt and the research in fact shows the opposite, that high achievers tend to have imposter syndrome because there's just genuinely like a lack of peers to relate to and you're kind of battling your own expectations for yourself. Um, what can you tell us about how you balance maintaining a level head and balancing other people's perceptions of you with the reality of day-to-day -day life? Yeah. Okay. I remembered the point that I was going to make and, um, you were talking about sort of creating, well, like not blaming your teams and stuff. And I think, um, so the, the thing that I wanted to say is like, part of the reason that I'm here today is to try and normalize imposter syndrome to show that like, you know, here I am, I don't feel like a successful person. Um, like, that's just how I am. And I feel like, uh, you know, externally, people tell me that I am, but that doesn't like, it doesn't, it's not a like an emotional reality for me. So I'm here to sort of say like, like, I guess this, this is part of the reason that I'm here is to like, talk about, like, I'm in a position of privilege or power or I guess whatever and I want to just like make it very clear to say that like I'm also just a normal person who has imposter syndrome and goes to work every day um, so your question was let me just rephrase it to make sure I get back on point uh, it's um, oh god you you go for I'll, it. I'll, I'll go back to it <laughs> yeah um, a lot of people would consider you to be quite a high achiever and I think you know, your role kind of reflects that. Everything, your experience and everything that you've done in the tech community. Um, how do you kind of keep a healthy level head despite balancing imposter syndrome and having these expectations that people yeah. have? Um, so I think for me, it's always come down to focusing on the outcome that I'm trying to deliver because I freelanced or consulted for so long. Like I got really good at, at um, seeing like, like going into a project and being like, okay, like they want this code written or they want this product built, but like, what is like, why, like, what is the reason for that? And it, it kind of like, I'm, I kind of balance product and um, software development in my, my role most of the time. And for me, it feels really like that convert, that tension between product where you want to like have something go out the door and there's a reason for it. And then the development side of things where you're, you know, coding to make that re a reality, but like those needs will change. So um, for me, it's really come down to focusing on like, what are the, what are the outcomes that I'm looking to achieve um, from not like, not personally, this is a weird thing where like, I, I'm very non-strategic as a as an individual like i just say yes when an opportunity comes up and try to do things that are interesting um and so it's more that like once i'm in that role uh i'm trying to please the other people there so that, like maybe so they don't discover that i shouldn't be there kind of thing like that's the internal dialogue that i'm having with myself of like I hope they don't find me out. I need to make sure I accomplish this goal. Um, so it really is something where I think like just focusing on the, um, the outcome or the direction that you're going rather than, you know, whether or not you should be there because really it doesn't matter. Um, at this point in time, like I've hired a lot of people and worked with a lot of other people and like, it's way easier to, um, or if you're in a spot, it's like much easier for you to be, um, just find out what, you know, find out what your team needs or what the business needs and focus on delivering that rather than worrying about whether or not you're capable of doing it. If it's a good organization, they'll help you get there because like, it's not, it shouldn't be, well, 
this I, I should quantify that. If it's a good organization for me, then that organization will help you get there. I'm not super competitive externally with other people or or whatever. Um, I'm just I try to bring everyone along with me, and I'm a little bit competitive with myself to try and achieve more. So, yeah. That's a great perspective. Um, my next question was kind of more on dismantling the construct of imposter syndrome. So I wanted to hear from you, um, in your opinion, uh, who do you think the responsibility lies in and dismantling imposter syndrome, like just the, like the construct as a whole? Do you think it's on individuals? I hear a lot of um, just people I speak to in the industry say like, I know that's my imposter syndrome that I have to deal with. Or do you think it's more like families and socialization or organizations? It could go bigger than that. Any opinion on that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I can speak to it. I'm going to say some stuff now that I feel like I'm not qualified to say. So I'll just put that caveat in front of it. But um, I don't know if, so for me, like I didn't experience imposter syndrome until I moved into the tech industry. Uh, I mean, I guess that's not true. It's just that I didn't know what it was. And the tech industry is so new that it's easy to feel like you don't belong because, um, you know, I, I used to do, I used to work in construction and the green building industry. And like, if you look at the building code for British Columbia, for example, where we live, it's changed like, three times since 1970. There's been like a few addendums, but it's like how to build a house or a commercial building hasn't really, like the way you do that hasn't changed. Whereas like getting into the tech industry, like uh, I started writing CoffeeScript and there were no border radiuses in CSS. And like now we're at this point where like I've learned a few languages and like it feels like every every week there's like something changing or a new piece of technology that we absolutely have to be using. Um, and if you're not using it, then you're kind of fail kind of thing. That pace of change is so high that it it, um, it creates a, um, a really easy spot to feel like you don't belong because like maybe you've never done React and you're busy doing whatever old language. Um, and so I feel like from that perspective, there's to uh, dismantling imposter syndrome from a, an organizational perspective. It's just to, um, it should be on the organization to sort of say, like hire somebody if they don't, if they're not proficient in the language you're using or whatever to like create that space to onboard you, not have crazy expectations up front, but rather be like realistic about the fact that like things are changing quickly and like, it's going to be worth it in the long run to maybe um, hire the right person that like takes some time to get to where they need to be from a like technical knowledge perspective, or you know even like in the business on the business side of things because like the marketing strategies and like you know for me I've seen marketing move from SEO to content to I don't I think it's like storytelling content now uh, is sort of the new thing. So like, you know, it feels like there's these waves or patterns that are emerging just in like the specialties that you'd see within like a tech company as well. So I feel like that part of things is something where organizations should both like make room for people to grow, but also like figure out how to help their people grow and then normalize that idea. Like, like I'm trying to do here, normalize the idea that like, we probably at any given moment might only know 30% of what we need to know to do our job and we're gonna to have to figure out the rest. Um, so for me, that would be where like the organizational piece of it. And then I think like at an individual level, um, it's important to just like normalize these conversations um, or like the, the different things that might have some sort of stigma around them or might be like, make it harder to sort of engage or dig in um, by having these kinds of conversations and participating in a community and stuff like this. And also just like celebrating the things that you do have wins at because like 
I know that's that's something that I have a, I, I personally have a really hard time with is just like if I do succeed it's like well that was an accident is like that's my internal dialogue so you know I feel like it can't be the responsibility for that can't land in one spot because it's such a human thing and um, it's yeah it, there's just so many levels of where where we could I, I guess where like the approach should be taken to remedy it. Totally. I'm actually really glad that you said specifically that it's a very human thing because in my research about imposter syndrome, I found that um, there isn't really like a direct tie to depression and anxiety, which a lot of people would associate with, with something that has a name like this. Um, I think the research shows that it's around like at least 70% of people that have feelings like this. And um, it's not tied to performance or anything like that. It's just a very natural human response. So we should treat it as such and ingrain our processes around that. And I love what you said around uh, recruitment. I think the, the best way to combat kind of like exclusionary practices is um, investing in people rather than specific technologies, which are so fickle and uh, I don't know, they have only a certain shelf life, which we've come to find out in recent years. Um, so, uh, I do want to leave some time for audience questions too. So I might just have a couple more. Um, what advice would you give to your past self or someone else who's just getting into the tech scene and struggling with feeling like an outsider? Um, so I tend to give this advice more to like people who are developers, but I, I think it's like applicable across. It's more just that like, that's my experience. So it's easier for me to like have an opinion about it. That's, you know, I, I know is somewhat valid, but there's this process I feel like that I went through when I was learning JavaScript for the first time where like I would come into a situation and be like, I have no idea what I'm doing. And I just try stuff until something worked. And then I would I'd be on this, like if you were to like graph Matthew's like mood to like time or <laughs> lines of code written, it's like jubilation. I got it done to like crippling anxiety and despair because I'm never going to be able to do this. And like, I feel like that, um, that curves flattened out for me a little bit and or it, it's become expected. Um, so when I'm I'm in a situation where I am dealing with something unknown, it's just like it's a familiar feeling. So I can say to myself, okay, like having an emotional response, uh, take a second or two to like under try and understand why, and then like, you know, use the tools or like like the experience that I've had to try and like get around it. Um, and and see a pathway through. So I feel like um, it's that might not be like a really hands-on, like it's not a, a it's not a like tool to remove imposter syndrome, but more like just the idea that like it's gonna if if you have imposter syndrome, it'll probably be there forever, uh, and so like don't worry about it. Like really, just try to focus on other things. Um, you mentioned depression and anxiety earlier, which is like, that's something that I've dealt with on and off uh, for most of my life. And um, for me, like imposter syndrome and anxiety are very, like the way that I deal with them is very similar in that like um, anxiety is something that I try to uh, ignore because it's like, becomes a, a mental loop where I just will hyper focus on a thing that's causing the anxiety. So like if I can distract myself with from it, then like that can I can like calm down and de-stress. And I feel like um, imposter syndrome is kind of the same way where uh, if it's happening there, it will just like it's vying for all of my attention to pull me into the spot where I can't move forward or I can't do something. And so as long as I can sort of like step back for a second, you know, like get that out of body experience where I can like look down at, right? Like that's not the right word, but like take an experience where I've stepped out of the situation a little bit and like sort of just take stock of the emotions that I'm having and physical sensations and like 
then um, and then and then sort of like say, okay, well, like all of this is happening, it's true, but like this is the thing that I need to achieve, so like move forward. And I feel like that's sort of the um, that for me is the thing that I would I would say to anybody that's in, experiencing imposter syndrome. Um, I just have a little story that I feel like if we're get, if we're going to move on to um, to questions or whatever, that this was something that really helped me. Uh, a friend of mine, I was talking to, I was working at a place where um, I was working with somebody who I think had Dunning-Kruger syndrome, which is, so I feel like that's the op opposite of imposter syndrome. So Dunning-Kruger syndrome is like uh, being confident in a situation, but not knowing how much you don't know. Um, so it's like just taking something, being oversimplifying it and moving forward without sort of taking stock of it and like just being very confident. Um, and having imposter syndrome, I tend to believe that everyone else in the world has imposter syndrome. So if they're telling me that something is true, it's because they have like looked into it and researched it and it's the truth. I was in this situation where like this was happening and I was like, am I going crazy? Or is this like, is this reality real? Like, am I, is everything I'm experiencing wrong? Or is this like person, um, you know, actually not not as experienced as they are telling me that they are. And I was talking with a friend of mine about this, and she relayed this experience or this story of a friend of hers. Which okay, so her friend was like a senior vice president at Siemens, like the global telecommunications microchip company, um, and he'd worked there for I think twenty years or something. And the whole time he was there, he felt like he was doing a bad job. And every time that somebody put a challenge in front of him, he's like, oh, this is a, a threat to my employment here. And he would do it. And because of that, he went from just being, you know, an employee into management, into middle management, upper management, to like the executive level of this multinational corporation. And I was like, oh man, like this is really a great practical like application. Like it, I'm not, I don't have aspirations of doing that, but I can see how imposter syndrome, like when you leverage it, or if, you, if you're having it and you can like focus on the outcome rather than being debilitated by it, it can be something that like helps to motivate or like push you along into new things. So I, I feel like that's something that like, you know, it sucks and it feels uncomfortable to not feel like you belong or feel like you're, you're not, you know, this isn't the spot for you, but, um, it's also something that like on the flip side you can use to like help you like if if you know that that's going to be there um it can help you to just move forward or move on past that and like you know accomplish the thing that you thought was impossible for yourself that's a pretty interesting take actually just like acknowledging that you're kind of you have something and leveraging it as a tool um yeah, it, you yeah, you touched on um, also kind of incorporating it into the or like recognizing it as like part of the scope of the job, and I really resonated that that like resonated with me a lot because um, like as a software engineer, I remember I used to just tell people like I don't know how many other jobs people go to every day where you're like I don't really know what, how I'm gonna do my job today, but I guess I'm just gonna have to figure it out. Um, and I think that's probably more relatable to, to other industries too. We just like, maybe don't know about it. Um, that's amazing. Um, I would love to hand off now to audience Q&A because we have about 20 minutes left and the chat has been very active. So um, lots of really great conversation that's happened already and um, a couple of great points where um, someone pointed out that it's wonderful to hear a man talk about imposter syndrome, which uh, I can definitely agree with. Um, yeah, I wanted to see if anybody wants to uh, either toss a question into the chat or unmute and ask now. I will also say that, uh, oh, sorry, I was just going to say if you do unmute, um, we are recording this. So uh, if you're not comfortable speaking, Feel free to just type it into the chat. 
if no one is typing. Um, I find that with imposter syndrome, I definitely like minimize, yeah, what I, my experience or my work. And so when it comes time for say like self reviews or negotiating, um, that could potentially really hurt. And so like, what are some things that you might find useful to, I don't know, like write down accomplishments and learnings because I usually just kind of, I feel like if I can do something, then anyone can, or um, I don't really think about what I'm learning and how I'm improving. I just normalize that. And so it can be hard to like remember when it comes time to, and when it's important. Um, <laughs> okay. So I work with a personal coach from time to time. And the, the last person that I worked with suggested this thing called a rainbow list to me. And the rainbow list is basically like an accomplish, like a list of accomplishments that you can like with dates. So you can just like look back over it. And for somebody like me, that's nice because I can look at it. I'm also super bad at writing things on this list, but you can just look at it and be like, oh, I did this thing. And like, in the moment, like you build that, like um, you can build that reinforcement of like a positive self image because it's like you have some reference material to look at um, over time. So that would be, I think, from a like writing things down perspective, that's something that I've I've um, have tried to do, and it it like it's nice to reflect on. I'm just inconsistent with it on a personal level. Doesn't mean you will be, but that's something. Um, and then, like I mentioned earlier, with having depression and anxiety, I have to, I have had to sort of keep a very, um, I've, I've had to be very vigilant about sort of my mental health and like the things that are affecting me. Otherwise, it's really easy for me to go to a fairly, you know, unproductive, dark place. Um, and so, I don't know if that's not, that's not a great actionable answer for you, but just more that like, it's probably going to be way more beneficial for you in the long run to take that time to focus on like yourself and who you are so that when you show up to a situation, you're like showing up as the best version of yourself that you can in that moment, um, rather than, uh, showing up as you know somebody who's triggered and like frazzled or whatever that's at least how i try to do things i as i like hopped on this call earlier i was like telling the telling Miriam and alana and um carolyn that i'm just like having a low-grade panic attack until we start and then i'll be probably be fine and i'm fine now but like <laughs> yeah okay thank you any other questions from the crew? On the note of talking about how it's nice to hear a man talk about imposter syndrome, do you find that um, it's hard to talk about it with other men? Or do you find that the conversation is pretty open um, with others of your gender? Um. I feel, I'd say it's like fairly split. It kind of it kind of depends. Um, like this is something where I, it, for me, like on an individual level, like what I was talking about earlier, where like I I like finding a place that fits you. Um, that to me is sort of the like. Um, I, I guess it sort of falls into that where like my I'm selective with friends and social gatherings and like um, even with work or clients that I'd take on I want to make sure that it's like back in the day I'd want to make sure that there was like alignment and like respect so that I could you know like I'm like I said I'm a sensitive person so if I'm not like if things aren't if the conditions around me aren't going to be like great, then I'm not going to succeed. And I've, you know, like, so I try not to put myself into situations where I know that there's going to be some of that stuff. So I think that's a hard, that's a hard question for me to answer, like ubiquitously, but just like, I would say that, you know, in the sort of like management relationships I've had with people, it's been about 50-50 where I've like 
talked about this kind of thing and it's been an open and easy conversation and you know so i i, I think there's dudes out there that are willing to talk about this stuff but yeah so we have some questions in the chat as well um this one is from mary and she asked uh do you feel networking and getting to know people in the industry reduced your imposter syndrome at all oh boy um no <laughs> so um it i don't think it did for me because like i don't think that i don't think i think what reduce or what's helped with my feelings of imposter syndrome is just understanding that there are more people who have it um so i guess getting to know other people in the industry or seeing like when i was coming up and like learning stuff and like for me it really feels like only in the last sort of three years that I've gotten to a point where like I'm I ha like my voice has any validity like or that like my experience has sort of come to a point where like I can say I'm on a CTO and co-founder and I've been this other thing so like people listen to me a little bit more I feel so I feel like when I was coming up I saw people um who were dealing with imposter syndrome and spoke openly about it. So it helped me understand that like, it's probably happening to a lot of people. Um, so I guess like, yes, it did help me, but it's more that, um, it's more that it helped me. I it, like networking and getting to know people helped me because I found out that it's sort of normal. That's great to hear. Um... Yeah, as I was kind of looking into like ways we as an industry can combat imposter syndrome, I found time and time again from psychologists that the top thing that they've recommended is just talking about it. Like people at all experience levels just talking about it. And the more we talk about it, the like the more it's normalized, as you said. Um, so that's why I'm glad we're doing this. Uh, we have another question from Jennifer uh, and she asked, uh, this year, it looks like teams are moving towards remote. Do you have any suggestions for combating imposter syndrome when your team is remote? And have you sensed any imposter syndrome in your own team this year? Oh boy, yeah. Um, so I've almost always worked remote, like with the caveat of when I was at Pixel Union. Um, that was the only time that I didn't have a remote job. So for me, um, dealing with imposter syndrome has always been a remote thing so i can't i guess i can't really speak to the difference between in person and um and remote imposter syndrome um i i would say that so i guess i'll move on to the second question which i think will be more helpful um in that like so my team is um there's only four people on it right now and we have a couple of contractors that we work with right now and there's definitely, it's funny, uh, I don't know if anybody, have, any of them are on this call, so I'm, but I'm, I'm gonna say that there's two of them that I, I believe have imposter syndrome. We have never specifically named it or talked about it as imposter syndrome, but you know, the sense is there where like, they're not sure if they're contributing in the right ways or moving things forward in the right ways. So for me, that's something where I, I like as a manager or like in, in my role as their sort of team lead or whatever, I'm helping to, um, I'm trying to help them just get a sense of feeling comfortable. And also like, if they aren't, if somebody isn't performing to make it clear that it's not like, like what it is that they need to be doing because I think oftentimes with um, with imposter syndrome and the individual it's not it's not a matter of performance it's more of a matter like it's it's a matter of like getting in your head or like getting in your own way so I think that's something where I'm you know Like I, my engagement is from people on the team and like if I notice they're more quiet in chat or on code review or you know like in some of the product discussions we're having I'll try to like reach out and like make sure that they're 
like like figure out what's going on there and sometimes it's that like maybe symptomatic of them dealing with imposter syndrome and maybe symptomatic of something else but i think it's that's a it's a hard thing to answer from the, like the individual's point of view um and more that i'm as a as a leader or manager i'm trying to do a good job in making sure that like that's not coming to play in the day to day for the people that I'm working with. That's great. Uh, oh, I was just about to say, I think we have time for one more and we got one more. Just then. Um, so this one's from Alexander who asks, when you first started in tech, what was the first time that you felt you belonged or felt qualified and that imposter syndrome faded a little? Um, so I worked by myself. Like I took on freelance contracts for about two and a half years. And then I joined a team, like got embedded in a team project. And I realized, and so I had this like sense that like I could write code and it would work, but I always felt like it was bad or I wasn't doing a good job, good enough job. Um, and when I joined this team, it was like positive feedback from them. Like it was a real crazy project and that we had to ship some like a gigantic thing in a couple of weeks. And I was basically working 12 hour days uh, for that period of time. But it, I, I realized that at that point in time, like the podcasts that I'd listened to and the blog posts I'd read and the things that I put into practice just on my own, like made me, I was, I was a reasonably productive developer. Um, I mean, I, yeah, I, I, that's how I feel about it. I think they said I was really good, but I don't like saying that. I'm just, it feels weird. Um, so I feel like that, that's the, for me that like, it was when I could, when I could compare myself to something a little bit more tan, tangible or objective that um, it helped, that helped me but it was still, it's still like an intellectual thing where I can like, I can tell you that these are the facts, but I don't feel like it's not an internalized belief on an emotional level. It's very much still a work in progress, it sounds like, which I think is relatable. Um, okay, so we're nearing the end of our time here. So I wondered if, uh, you can let us know how people in the audience can follow along with the work. Oh people. boy. Uh, I don't use any social media. So I Good luck. technically have a, a Twitter account. Um, and at One Feather, um, we're just about to launch a bunch of stuff probably that we've been working on sort of quietly for the last year or so. Um, so you could follow that on like on Twitter and LinkedIn or me on LinkedIn if you want to. Um, just mention that you met me here because right these days um, my LinkedIn is just full of people who want to connect because they have uh, about 45 offshore developers that they want me to hire. <laughs> um, so just give me a little personal note and we can chat there. Sounds great. Matthew, if you share whatever updates you have with One Feather with us, then we can put that out in the Career Accelerator community too, and uh, the links for your Twitter and, and LinkedIn on there as well. Sweet, I will do that. Amazing. Well, I want to thank you, Matthew, and everybody else for coming. I thought this was a really great conversation. And I believe if anybody's interested in having any follow-up conversation, Caroline should be sending out details for the career accelerator where you can just type in the chat. Yeah, I'll send the, I'll send, so everyone here will get an instant replay of uh, this recording, which is great. And then you can also please leave feedback uh, in the feedback form that we're sending out. And you can also just respond to that email. Uh, Justine and I are on the other side of that. So if you had any further questions, we can try to answer them in the career accelerator newsletter um, or if you have recommendations for um, the types of people you'd like to hear from in our next events then that's also great sounds great all right i think that caroline has zoom 
like powers here. So I'll let you take over, Caroline. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Well, thanks again, Matthew. It was really great to have you, and thanks for sharing those in insights. It was great for uh, the insights on the tech sector specifically. Um, and I see the chat blowing up with gratitude here. So that's great. Lots of silent claps going on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. All right, we'll leave it at that. And uh, everyone will have a instant replay in their inbox soon. Thanks so much. See you all.